Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, the second in our series about uh, webinars relating to the midterm elections and um, news literacy. Um, this one is is uh, produced in partnership with the League of Women Voters and their Education Fund, and we are very proud. We are very glad to have their support, um, especially as we are trying to promote um the tools and skills and resources to be informed voters especially in what is looking to be a very important midterm election um, so welcome to the session on misinformation my name is john silva i am part of the professional community learning team here at the news literacy project um, i was part of the first session i'll be doing the, the session next week um, this my team is responsible for teaching news literacy concepts to adult audiences. Um, and in particular, we focus a lot on educators, but we've been expanding our offerings to the general public. If you'd like to reach out to me at, directly after today's session, um, please feel free to use my email address there um, at the lower left hand of your screen. Um, since this is a webinar, um, your interaction is somewhat limited. Um, this is, unfortunately, this is what enables us to have a large audience. Um, so if you have a question that you would like to address to me about any of the things that I'm covering, about the examples, you can drop it in the Q&A. Um, if you would like to simply make a comment uh, to, to share your thoughts with everyone, you can use the chat function. Um, so we are very happy to get started. I'm, I'm very glad to have the support of three of my colleagues, Alexa Volland and Demario Phipps and Allie Quick are with me, they're gonna be helping to support the chat. They're gonna be monitoring the chat and the Q&A, and they'll be dropping some links to some of the resources and some of the things that are relevant um, in, in the chat for you to be able to review. Um, a couple of things, this is being recorded and the, the recording will be made available in a couple of days. We will also make the slides available and you'll get a lot of the links that we share here in a follow-up email that Ali will be sending in a few days. So let's start with the broadest concept. Let's start from the very top about misinformation. Um, what is it? So I'm gonna ask you to please get out your phones and you can just snap that little QR code or you can use menti.com and use the code that you see on your screen. I'd like you to define misinformation in three words. Like what three words? Um, I kind of wanna get a sense of where you are in terms of what you understand about misinformation um, what you think it means and, and what it is that we might be talking about. Um, hopefully, as if we do this right, it will start to form a word cloud so that we can sort of talk about some of these things. Misleading has come out and also with intentionally misleading. Interesting that several of you had said biased, okay? I see some things about uh, with some emotions, like with outrage, somebody has an agenda. Fake news makes an appearance in the word cloud. But misleading seems to be one of the most popular terms here, misleading and false and untrue. Okay, I'm going to let this go for just another minute. Um, I love how much we're getting on this. Um, I'm going to share this word cloud when we're done so we can kind of see. Okay, mistakes, malicious, interesting. Um, we see the word propaganda in there. Okay, here's the interesting thing. All of these words and terms connect in some way to discussions about misinformation because the reality is Misinformation as a term has an incredibly broad definition. Literally, if you can describe a piece of information with using one of these words, you're talking about misinformation. And uh, discussions of intent are actually not relevant to defining misinformation. Intent is another piece of the, the, the puzzle when we're talking about uh, false information. Um, intent, um, is what differentiates disinformation, right? So disinformation has that, that intent where somebody creates it, they know that it's not true and they're spreading it and they want people to think that it is, right? So misinformation 
very, very broad concept. And what we're going to try to do tonight is we're going to try to talk about some of the aspects of misinformation, the realities of what misinformation looks like, especially relating to elections. And hopefully we can just get to a better understanding of what misinformation is and why it's such a major problem. One of the most important things that makes this really complicated is the fact that like the term fake news, misinform calling something misinformation is now a political strategy, right? People are calling things misinformation, not because they're false, um, but they're, they're using it to label things that say like, I don't like that, or I don't agree with that, or that makes me look bad. So people are using the term misinformation as this very dismissive and very divisive term. Um, so it's become weaponized and politicized, and that makes it that much more difficult to talk about misinformation because now we're not arguing about what we can verify. We're arguing about what people think about it. And so we're going to get into a little bit of that. The, the other part that makes misinformation complicated to talk about is the fact that when we what we see in our social media feeds, what we see in... Uh, political advertisements and, and even with political propaganda, there is often an element of truth that is part of the message that's being sent. Um, and so misinformation isn't always a binary in this in this sense, right? There is a range of things that's something, can, and so that's when we talk about some of these fact-checking organizations, they have these, these sort of these scales that they use when they're talking about false information. Um, so we we could say something is is misinformation and we just we can define it in these very black and white terms but the reality is this is a very nuanced topic and so we're going to try to break this down um the first thing i want to sort of talk about is to talk about these fact checking these fact checking organizations and what their fact checks look like because it's important for us to understand what to look for so that we can talk about some of the examples that i have so i have this um this is this is a, a recent fact check that was published by PolitiFact. Um, Kanye West um, uh, uh, about a week or so ago claimed that uh, George Floyd uh, died from a fentanyl overdose, not because he was actually murdered by Derek Chauvin. Um, so one of the first things that we see when we look at this, when we look at a fact check, there needs to be an overall rating. They need to tell us, is it true? Is it false? Is it somewhere in between? So we need to see, we need to look to see what their determination is. Other things that we want to look for in a fact check is that we need to see the sources that they used to make their determination, right? So PolitiFact puts links to the sources in the body of the fact check. They also put a citations list. They put it effectively a bibliography at the end of their each article so that we can actually go see the evidence for ourselves. We can, we can, we can evaluate it for ourselves to see why they made their determination. Also, what we need to look for is the fact that the fact-checking organization give us all the relevant and important context that is part of this, that is part of the story here, right? So the thing is that there is an element that, of truth that George Floyd, according to the medical examiner, um, did determine that he had fentanyl in his system. However, that's not what killed him. What killed him was Derek Chauvin's knee on his neck through uh, what's called the, through the restraint neck neck compression. So we need to we need to have all the context to be able to evaluate a fact check on its surface. We also want to see that they are transparent in how they do their work. If you go to Politifact's website, they have a whole page that's dedicated to their to how they do their work. What is their methodology? How do they how do they make the determinations? How do they decide what they're going to fact check? Um, what are their criteria for their different ratings? Um, and so we can and we can even see what they do if they make a mistake, if they get it wrong. How do they issue corrections? So reputable, credible fact-checking organizations effectively, they show their work, right? They don't just tell us something is false and they move on. They're, they're detailed and they have evidence and we can evaluate that evidence for ourselves. And there are a number of great fact-checking organizations out there doing this work. Um, and they are, they're all following these standards. Um, and so you can see a number of these. Some of these are independent um, of news organizations, but there are some like NPR and the Washington Post have their own fact-checking um, departments. Um, I do want to address Snopes really quick. 
Um, I think Snopes gets a lot of sort of negative attention. I think people have a negative perception of Snopes. I don't always understand why, but I suspect for a lot of us, it's that Snopes doesn't have like the most polished professional looking website. And they also kind of cover things that can be a little on the ridiculous side. Like they, they do talk about myths and urban legends in addition to political things and other types of fact checks. And, but if you look at the work that Snopes is doing, by and large, they, they are doing good fact checking work. So I think, I think they get some unfair um, criticism. So I see that there are some questions here. Um, uh, I'm just gonna see if there's anything I need to address right now. Um, so Janine, uh, just so you know, and so everyone else knows, um, the recording to the first session has been posted to our website. Uh, we'll drop a link to that uh, in the chat and you'll be able to see it. This one will be posted to the same page and then next week's session as well. Um, okay. So one of the most important things we have to understand about misinformation is that it is trying to target our emotions. Misinformation is all about emotional manipulation. Um, and what it does, the stronger the emotional response, the more likely we are to believe misinformation. Because what happens is that in that emotional response, um, the emotion centers of our brain are working overtime, processing the information emotionally. And the rational parts of our brains are kind of just taking a break. We're not really thinking about it, we're reacting. And in that sense, we're not really evaluating it. We're just determining whether or not it feels true or not. In our work with educators, we emphasize about human brain development. When we talk about adolescence, the parts of our brain that deal with rational critical thought are pretty much the last parts to fully develop. And those parts of our brain aren't really fully developed until about the early to mid twenties. And then when we talk about older adults, it's a little bit different because as we get older, we have a stronger attachment to our beliefs. The things that are important to us, we have an emotional connection to our beliefs. And some of those beliefs become important parts of our identity. And so it's really easy to manipulate our emotional attachment to, to those beliefs. Um, I'm gonna show you an example um, that's designed for like sort of a maximum emotional response. I want you to think about when you see this, um, think about what your first emotional reaction is. You can either just write it down, you can put it in the chat, or just think about what is your first emotional reaction when you see this. I see Elaine says disgust. I see anger. I see, I see some emojis floating up saying shock, calling them jerks, ignorance, right? This is meant to be basically like, almost like a punch in the gut, right? One of the things that's mo like, one of the things that this is really designed to do is this is targeting parents, right? This is targeting the parents of young children. Most, or no, a lot of disinformation and misinformation and conspiracy theories about vaccines are targeting adults of small children or adults who may be uh who may may start to have children soon because if you think about the emotion manipulation at play here when you are a parent of a very small child that is a very scary time in your life right you are completely responsible for the survival of this tiny human being i remember just losing a lot of sleep over so many things when my son was very was very young Right, and it's really easy to tap into those fears and exploit those anxieties, and get people to question their beliefs about things like vaccines. Right, and it's it's really and so this is where that emotional manipulation happens. You take somebody who's already emotionally vulnerable, who already has anxiety about something, and then you just you just tap into that and you and you make it worse. This is how misinformation like this takes hold. Now, here's the interesting thing. This. This example was posted recently, actually in the last few weeks or so, to Instagram by Dr. Jane Ruby. Um, Jane Ruby is not a doctor. Um, Factcheck.org has, has debunked a number of her things. Um, she calls herself Dr. Jane Ruby because she actually filed the requisite paperwork to have a company named Dr. Jane Ruby. But 
frequently when you see her on social media or in some of her public speaking appearances, she'll come out in a lab coat and she has a stethoscope, right? And she's a she's a very prominent figure in a lot of anti-vaccine circles, but also a lot of the 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 extreme misinformation views about the COVID pandemic and a number of other things, right? But we may not actually see all of that because we just have this emotional response. We see that it's from a doctor that we're not thinking about it. Remember, we're in an emotional space. And so we don't take the moment to actually question whether or not she's actually a doctor. And that's the, that's the thing. When we go into that emotional reaction, we are not engaging in rational thinking. We're engaging in emotional reasoning, right? And depending on the situation, it could feel rational, but it's actually not, right? Because we're 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 only thinking, we're only really processing it based on how it feels, right? And so that's what misinformation wants us to do. It wants us to be in this emotional space. Because if we were in a rational space, we would ask questions, right? We would ask questions about where this meme came from. We would ask, who is doctor, this Dr. Jane Ruby? Is she really a doctor? If she is, what kind of doctor is she? What are other people saying about this, right? Is the, does this make sense, right? If that's rational thinking. And, and so we, that's where we need to be, but, but misinformation is about manipulating us away from that. And one really important thing for us to remember, right? Is that if we're engaging in rational thinking, if we're actually really thinking clearly, we have the ability to entertain a notion. We can think about it, we can consider it, we can process it, but we can also reject it if we want to, right? That's rational reasoning. Emotional reasoning is the opposite of this. Emotional reasoning is not really entertaining it, it's either accepting it or rejecting it based on emotions. Part of this is about confirmation bias. Right, this is the cognitive process in our brains where if something agrees with us, we're likely to accept it without questioning because we like it when things agree with us. That feels good to have our beliefs reinforced. And likewise, if, if something disagrees with us, we may reject it because we don't like our beliefs being challenged, right? Because we're in an emotional reasoning space, not a rational reason. Confirmation bias is trying to keep us in that emotional space. And then if you go even deeper, you might start engaging in motivated reasoning. This is where we are going deeper into that emotional reasoning, and we're trying to interpret things in a very specific way. Um, a librarian I once worked with described this as a conclusion in search of confirming evidence, right? I'm only going to look for things that support this belief that I have because I really need my belief to be true. And I'm going to ignore anything that challenges it because I don't want to do that. I don't like that. That doesn't feel good. Because remember, we're in an emotional space, not a rational space. And any of our emotions can actually be used against us. When we're talking about a lot of political things, we're going to be talking about a lot of fear and a lot of anger. Those are going to be very, very common, right? But sometimes we, something might make us laugh. And in, in that, when, we're, when we find it really funny, we still we may believe it even though it, it, it isn't true. And so any emotion can be manipulated. And that's why we have to be really aware of our emotional responses. And we're gonna talk, we're, we're gonna look at some examples about how some of those work in a few minutes. The last piece that connects this is that it's important to recognize that two people looking at the same piece of information might have different emotional responses. So this is not a real tweet. Somebody created this fake tweet, making it look like the Chicago Police Department's official Twitter account had tweeted this in support of Derek Chauvin, the Minneapolis police officer convicted of the murder of George Floyd, right? So depending on some of your personal views, right? Maybe it's your views about law enforcement in general, or perhaps the Chicago Police Department in particular. Maybe you have thoughts and perceptions and beliefs about the Derek Chauvin case and the murder of George Floyd. Maybe it's something connected to Black Lives Matter or Blue Lives Matter. There's a whole range of things. And those beliefs, what you have, can determine what your emotional response might be. Some people would see this and would be outraged or angered. Some people might see this and cheer because, because they, they, they support this. Right? They, they, they might be happy to see something like this. But the reality is all of them have been manipulated through their emotions to believe that it's true when it's not. 
So I'm going to pause here um, to see if there are some questions. Um, So Scott asks, what evidence is there that the annoying political ads during an election cycle actually work to change voters' minds? The ads are the uh, are the picture of misleading information done by both parties. Has there has there been any studies that show the ads make a difference? Um, Scott, I don't know of any particular studies off the top of my head. That's something we can look into and, and we'll try to follow up on that. Um, but the thing is, is that in a lot of ways, those ads those ads aren't always necessarily trying to get people to change their minds. They're some in some ways trying to prevent people from changing their minds, right? They're targeting, they're often targeting a certain uh, group of people and they're, and they are designed to, um, to sort of reinforce what people already believe. Um, but many of them are misleading and, and deceptive. We're going to talk about a little bit of that with some examples. Um, but it's interesting that you know, they, they probably do work to a certain extent. You know, there are, you know, there is, there are, we always talk about the swing voters and the undecided voters. We don't know always what influences us, but sometimes we, we tend to, you know, most of us tend to vote along certain party lines. Um, but the advertising must work to some extent uh, because they certainly put on a lot of it, but we will, we'll look to see how much, if there are some studies that talk about um, ads that make a difference and we'll kind of come back to that. Um, let's see. What is the main point of spreading misinformation? Um, that's so Karen Jackie in the chat asked, what's the main point of spreading misinformation? I'm going to use that to transition into the next, into the next section. Um, why is this a problem? Why does this happen? Why is it in some ways getting worse? Um, one of the things I want to emphasize before I dive into this, um, misinformation is not a social media problem. Um, social media didn't cause this. Um, political misinformation, disinformation, propaganda, outrageous political ads, you know, that's this has always been a challenge in elections. There's always been dirty politics in, in our elections. Social media has in some ways amplified it, has given given voice to marginalized groups that would maybe might not have found a wide audience to begin with. So the thing is like most of this, it's coming from somewhere. And in some ways, the social media platforms are simply are the, the conduit, which is why we need to sort of be able to recognize what we see regardless of the platform that we see it in. So we need to, we need to talk about motivations in a couple of different ways. So if we look at a particular piece of misinformation, the motivations can be very different for people who share it. Um, there can be different motivations for the people who create it. Um, and so motivations are very much dependent on the context where we see it or where we encounter it. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about, about that in particular, but this is where it's difficult to talk about motivations because there's a lot of variations depending on it. Um, when we take the time to really think about motivations, if we if we look at something and we pause and we ask the question, like what could what are the motivations behind this? Simply by asking that question, that helps us get out of the emotional space and move into a more rational space to evaluate it a little bit more clearly. Simply by asking the questions, this is what this is what we're trying to do. Is we we want to question what we see. We want to know what questions to ask. And when we do that, not only are we better able to understand misinformation, why it's a problem, why it spreads, but when we do that, we are also become um, less vulnerable to being manipulated by misinformation. So we broadly categorize five different motivations for misinformation. Um, there is often a financial component. Some, some sources will spread misinformation because they're trying to get you to click on links to a website and generate ad revenue. Some people will use misinformation for things like you know, fraudulent fundraising. Um, there's, there, there are a lot of instances where people are using misinformation and asking for donations at the same time. Some people use misinformation because they like what it feels like when people 
are interacting with it. They can, they feel like they're, they're influencing things, right? When people like our content, like when we share something and people like it and retweet it and comment on it, that feels good, right? There's a, there is a certain dopamine hit that comes along with people agreeing with us, especially if it's strangers on the internet. So sometimes people use misinformation as a tool because they are trying to be more influential or trying to influence people a certain way. Some people do it because they can and they want to see what kind of a reaction they get. We usually refer to these people as trolls, right? People will spread shocking false information because they want to fool people and they want to, they just want to see how much trouble they can cause. When we're talking about a lot of election related misinformation, though, we're really talking about the last two. Obviously, political divisions is, is one of the most important. People are using misinformation as a political tool because they want you to vote for, for someone or for something or vote against it, right? So they're trying to deepen and exploit our political divisions, but also, uh, also using social issues as part of that. So people are using misinformation as a weapon to drive these wedges and to create these divisions so that it's, it really feels like an us versus them kind of thing. And then the last part is, is, is about trust. Like what, what do we trust? Um, there's a lot of misinformation and conspiracy theories about election integrity and election security, right? Um, and it's actually creating situations where people are, feel like they can't vote safely and securely when it's actually the opposite is true. It, our elections are very safe and very secure and the number of fraud cases out there is shockingly low. Um, but also not, we're, we're also trying to undermine trust in um, institutions and elected officials and such. And so uh, trying to undermine trust is another important motivation. So who's doing this? So we have what we call, these are our four propagators. So one particular group are the people who are using misinformation because they're trying to promote themselves or their interests in some way, right? Misinformation is a, is a tool for them to promote themselves or something that they're invested in. Similarly though, it, we, we see it for groups, right? There, people are using it to support a group or a group is doing it to further their views or their positions. Sometimes though, people actually see something, they believe that it's true and they feel that it's important to share it with others. Um, so sometimes there is actually a sense of altruism behind sharing this information. And then on the opposite end of that spectrum is the malicious propagators, the trolls, the people who have the most extreme political and social views, people who are trying to promote some of these dark conspiracy theories. There are, so we call these malicious propagators. So I'm gonna to try to show some examples to illustrate how these all work together. Um, so they're not, it's not always easy to sort of call everything just one type of motivation, one type of propagator. There's a lot of variables here, so but I'm going to try to show some things to illustrate these key points about how they work together. So PolitiFact rated a uh, rated a press release from Mandela Barnes as being false, and um, he uh, he basically had made this claim um, that Ron Johnson uh, had voted against funding for law enforcement and basically was trying to to paint Senator Ron Johnson as as being um, I get anti-law enforcement. Um, the thing is, is that part of what he based this on was uh, a vote that actually happened 10 years ago um, about where Senator Johnson had voted in favor of a balanced budget. But some of the budget cuts that were sort of, he tried to make the connection, there was a very thin, very tenuous connection. Um, and then the other piece um, was a recent vote where Senator Johnson had voted against the American Rescue Plan Act and the COVID-19 Relief Act. So there's part of this legislation that Senator Johnson voted against. Um, but the reality is that it actually had nothing, it had very little um, connection to this idea about training and, and recruiting police officers. So why, so why is he putting this out here, right? So part of this, you know, he's, he's promoting himself, he's promoting, he's trying to get people to support him. Um, and so he's so he's trying to drive these these sort of political divisions, right? He's trying to get you to be opposed to Senator Johnson and support him. But you can also note that on this press release, there's a prominent donate button, right? So he, you know, a lot of the, a lot of times when when politicians put out things like this, you know, there's also a financial incentive. They're trying to get people to support their campaign monetarily. Um, and so when Politifact looked through this, right, they found that. 
that it that it is a very thin connection. There's very little evidence to support his claim, and so they they rated it as false. Um, so part of this is like a very kind of nuanced interpretation of things and a little bit of creative interpretation, right? So uh, Mr. Barnes had put this out, and but like his lo the logical connection was just not there. Um, compare this to Senator Patty Murray of Washington. So she put out this tweet that the Washington Post evaluated. Um, so she made this very broad claim. Um, and so in her tweet, she says, Republicans plan to end Social Security and Medicare. Um, and so then she's saying, you know, Washington, so she's trying to talk to Washington seniors. She's going to keep fighting to make sure they get it. Here's the thing. This is a very big claim that she doesn't support with any kind of evidence. Like she's not, she's not, she's not, you know, linking to a plan. She's not talking about specific actions that are being proposed. She's not talking about who's doing it. There's this very, just this very big claim. Um, but part of it is um, based off of statements that only a couple of Senate Republicans had said that actually had very little support. Um, and so she's really just trying to get people to accept this at face value, right? And she's trying to make people scared, a, a particular seniors, right? People who depend on Social Security, depend on Medicare. She's trying to make them scared about what might happen to their benefits, right? If Republicans um, uh, take control of the Senate after this election. But the thing is, like, it's false. Um, and because of this, the, the Post rated it as four Pinocchios. Um, but that's the thing is in that emotional response, in that fear, we might have this moment like, oh my God, that's that sounds terrible. But we actually, have, she's not backing it up with anything whatsoever. And that's actually something that's really important to look for, right? Is there evidence to support what they're claiming? And does, there, does the evidence that they cite make logical sense to back up their claim? Um, so with group interests, so this is from a group called um, Saving Arizona PAC, Political Action Committee, they put out this, um, this television ad, they posted to YouTube claiming that Senator Mark Kelly had voted to allow prison inmates to receive stimulus checks. Um, so this is the interesting thing. So they, they say this is mostly false, right? So this is where that, this is where there, there is an element of truth in there somewhere. Um, but basically, there were, there were three laws that were passed relating to uh, stimulus for the pandemic. Two of them were signed by former President Trump. One was signed by President Biden. And the thing is, those stimulus checks went out to millions of us. And prison inmates in that legislation were eligible to receive um, stimulus payments. Thing is, like one of the laws actually was signed and was signed into law before Senator Kelly was even elected to the Senate. Um, and he voted in favor of the other two, but he also voted against an amendment. So there's a there's a most of what they're most of what they're using to back up this claim um, is 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 not true. Um, Senator Kelly really wasn't involved in a lot of this. Um, and then there's also some of the politicking about when political parties supported it and when they didn't, depending on who was which president was in office. Um, but the thing is, like it's it's just this big broad. Um, claim that they're they're targeting Senator Kelly, and it's it's kind of a shocking claim that they're making. Um, but the reality is, like you know, there there's just there's not a lot there to actually pin on Senator Kelly to blame him for this. But then again, they don't want you to think about it. They want you to accept it at face value because of your views, maybe your views of Senator Kelly, maybe just this idea that pre that prisoners got stimulus checks, right? They want you to be in that emotional space. Um, the Lincoln Project, you might be familiar with their work. They put out a lot of these very well-produced um, advertisements. They use social media a lot. And one of the things, one of the ads that they had put out, they made this claim that um, every, every dollar that former President Trump had raised through his various uh, fundraising efforts. So this ad basically claimed that every dollar he raised went to his personal and business purposes. So basically um, making this broad claim that it's it's all a big scam and that somehow every single dollar raised was put in former President Trump's pocket in some way. Um, but they gave no evidence to back up their claim whatsoever. It's this, all of this, is, all of the, everything in this video is just one big claim after another, but they don't actually support it with any kind of evidence. And then when they were called out on it, when the Washington Post reached out to them and said, hey, can you provide us with some evidence to back up this claim? 
Um, they didn't. They they avoided it. They ignored it. And so basically, in in their research, uh, the Washington Post couldn't find any evidence to, to support this claim, right? But you know, when you see an advertisement like this, when you see a video that's really well produced, uh, it makes shocking claims. Um, people just tend to accept it. Um, I'm wondering how many of you saw the social media posts about um, Congresswoman Lauren Boebert of Colorado and the accusation that she had shot her neighbor's dog. Um, we actually featured this recently on our Rumor Guard platform. Um, so basically there was this, this Facebook post from someone named Yuritza Mendoza. She, this was long, detailed, very emotional Facebook post basically saying that um, Congresswoman Boebert had, had killed her dog. Um, and people shared this far and wide, right? Because it's, I mean, think about just how, how badly we feel about a dog being shot. And then your political views about Congresswoman Boebert can, can deepen that emotional response, right? And the thing is, is that once people started digging into it, um, it was not Congresswoman Boebert. There was a dog. Um, that had that had actually attacked other animals and and had and had been killed, but it was actually um, another person um, had actually shot and killed the dog. It was a different neighbor, not Congressman Bobert. Um, and then once the details started to unravel, then the person deleted their Facebook post. But people keep sharing it because sometimes those screenshots they live forever, and people continue to share it because they still think it's true. They haven't taken the time to evaluate it. So there's a lot of people who see this, they have this emotional response to it, and then they share it far and wide on social media. Um, and, and they don't take the time to really question it. So there, it sounds weird to say this, but there is a little bit of an altruistic motivation behind it because people think that it's true and they're trying to perhaps raise awareness, they're trying to influence people, right? They're trying to get the engagement, um, but they're spreading misinformation as a result. Um, somewhat similarly, this was posted to, uh, to Instagram. This person had posted a screenshot of something from the group Commitment to America. Um, and they were basically trying to make the claim that uh, Republicans were going to be um, denying all of these sorts of benefits to veterans, right? People have very strong feelings about veterans, right? There's a lot of emotional things that's tied up with this. But basically, it's a claim that if the Republicans take control of the House and the Senate, that veterans will lose these benefits, they'll be taxed for their veteran benefits, and all these things. The thing is, it's just none of it is true. And actually, the, the screenshot that was shared to social media was, was fabricated itself. Somebody created this fake post from Commitment to America, seemingly that like they were making this claim. But the whole thing was fabricated. But somebody saw this from somewhere, got really angry about it, posted it to Instagram. A lot of people shared it, right? Because they were angry about this. They were trying to prevent it from happening, but it was never going to happen in the first place. And then the last, so the last example, um, I'm not going to tell you where these are from because these, the, this site in particular and a number of others that are related to it they put out some of the most, in some ways, shocking, gross, outrageous, complete disinformation. These, these are literally fake news websites, right? They, they, they create these fake articles. Their sites are designed to look like, like they're real news sources, but they're not. So here's the thing, like they're, this, is, this happens a lot where they make these big claims that prominent uh, Democratic officials um, elected officials, former officials, people affiliated with the Democratic Party in particular, that they have been arrested for a wide range of things and then you know, put on military trial, you know, put on trial by the military, and then executed. So Ambassador Brink is alive and well, right? She was not hanged to death by the military. She was not arrested um, for the whatever gross claims that they were trying to make, right? So why do people do this? Like they are trying to just deepen some of the, the political divisions. They're trying to get people to be to share this, to, to smear good people's names. But there's also a very important financial component. Um, you know, this the, every time people click on one of their articles or share one of their articles, it generates uh, a little bit of ad revenue. Um, and that ad revenue um, uh, adds up. 
And so th these folks are not trying to inform us. They're not trying to persuade us. They're trying. They're just trying to put out the most shocking, disgusting content possible. And so the thing is, like, none of what they put is true, but they're they are they are malicious propagators because they are just putting out some of the worst disinformation, and they even deepen sort of conspiracy theories along the way. So I'm going to pause here. I think there's a number of questions. Um, so Karen asks, is an immediate timely response better or more effective um, as a response to misinformation? So here's the thing. If somebody posts something to social media and it's not true, um, the sooner somebody comments on it, calling it into question, the less viral it's going to go. Right. If we if we call it out, people are people may be less likely to share it or less likely to believe it. Um, the sooner we can address misinformation, the better. Right. Because that because we want to we want to slow down its its spread. That's one of the most important things. Uh, let's see. Bob asks, belief is what I accept as true or real, not accurate. For my belief, I adopt an attitude of an open or closed mindset. And then I develop a habit loop of behavior. Is this correct? And if so how do we bridge differences with people who are convinced and act on it to the detriment of others? So here's the thing. I think the, the really important framing for what you're asking, I think, is the difference between skepticism and cynicism. I think that's a really important part of this. We should be skeptical of the information that we see, and we should question it. And we also have to have the ability to accept it if it's if it's factual or accurate or reject it if it's not right that that idea that i can entertain the notion without accepting it i need to at least be able to 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 evaluate it in some sort of rational capacity right and so but our beliefs our our own biases our own perceptions definitely have a lot of influence on that and so i think in terms of open or closed mindset i think an open mindset is an important starting point and then as, as we do this more, right, we will begin to recognize patterns, right? And then eventually we will, if we see something from a certain site, and then we know, okay, I can't trust anything from that site, then I can be closed off to that, right? But there, there is, there is a certain amount of sort of practice that goes along with that. Um, the thing is that some people are going to be always closed-minded. They're going to be cynical to an extreme in some cases. And you're not going to make a lot of headway in trying to talk to have an open sort of rational conversation with them because people do tend to close themselves off. They get into that echo chamber or that filter bubble of belief and they're, they're hanging on to their beliefs through emotional reasoning, through confirmation bias and motivated reasoning, right? So they're, they're not, they're not open to new ideas. They're not willing to entertain the notion that they might be wrong. They're just going to be closed off to it. Um, Kate asks, did you question motivation before you question authority? Um, that's a really interesting question. I think it depends on how you define authority. Um, we've actually been talking a lot about this here at, the, at NLP when we're, we're trying to talk about, you know, it's a little bit like what's more important, um, credibility or trust. Um, I think it's an important personal thing for each of us, right? We all have a threshold of whether or not we can trust information from a particular source or a particular person, right? And then once that threshold is met, um, that source has to sort of continually earn our trust. It has, you know, it's easy to lose our trust. Um, and so I think it's really, I think we should question motivations of all of our information until we until we reach that threshold of trust and and we determine that they 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 do have enough credibility for me to trust them and so if that we apply that to how we define authority the same thing as i think we should question motivations because sometimes people who are in positions of authority may be trying to manipulate us um and misinformation does come from authoritative sources from time to time um elizabeth asks she's confused about the concepts of misinformation and disinformation um so here's the thing so disinformation has a very specific definition disinformation is is a piece of information that has been knowingly and intentionally created to be false and it is published or shared in a way that is is going to try to make people think that it's true 
right? So, so if I, so I can create a meme that, and, and I, and I put something that I know is false in that meme and I post it to social media because I want people to think that it's true, right? I have, I have created and I have shared disinformation. Once disinformation is out in the wild, though, it becomes misinformation, right? Because misinformation has that very broad definition. So if I see something and I and I think that it's true or I suspect that it's not, but I share it, right? I'm spreading misinformation because I may not know that it's true or not. So misinformation has that very broad definition, but disinformation is very specific. And so the thing is, is that disinformation often, we often associate it with state sources of information, right? The term disinformation actually originated with the KGB under the Soviet Union, where they created an office of disinformation, where they were deliberately trying to deceive people with some with false information. Um, so that's so that's um, that's what, what's happening with that. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, Um, how is Alex Jones being held legally accountable, but others are not for spreading misinformation about Sandy Hook? I think probably because Alex Jones was the loudest, most prominent voice with the the disinformation about the Sandy Hook uh, massacre. Um, a lot of the a lot of the false flag accusations started with Alex Jones, um, and people spread it from there. So he was sort of the source for all that. But also, you know with every almost every mass shooting since he continued to spread his the this, this propagandist disinformation about false flags and so he was one of the most prominent um voices in that and he actually you know benefited from these falsehoods um and and so they so he was probably the most prominent voice i think it's possible other people will face legal legal accountability i think in this case we had to go after alex jones first if we can prove Alex Jones was legally liable for it, then we can also go after others. Uh, let's see. Isn't there a danger? So Susan asks, isn't there a danger of elevating a post even if misinformation by commenting on it? Yeah, so that so that's where the algorithms become important, right? The more engagement a post gets, the more that post might be shared to other people's profiles by whatever algorithm of whatever platform you're using. Um, but if we comment on it and we call it out, it may still get elevated, but it's but if your post if your comment gets more engagement, like so example on Facebook, if people like your comment or engage with your comment, it will be featured more prominently in the list of comments. Um, so it's it's kind of a double-edged sword. Yes, we do run the danger of amplifying misinformation by commenting on it, but we also can contribute to lessening its spread at the same time. It's complicated because the algorithms are all very, very complex. Um, I will, so the last one, so Kay asks, is it better to report the ad or post or to reply or contact the poster about the misinformation? Um, I think it depends. Um, I think if, if you're, if, if it's someone, you know, or right, if it's someone you're connected to on social media, I think it would be important to, to contact them, to reach out to them. Maybe they would be less likely to share misinformation in the future. Um, but reporting a false post never hurts. Um, they may not do something, but every report does in the end, um, um, add up. So I want to move into the last little segment while we have some time, um, to give you some things to think about after we get done tonight, some ways that you can, what you can do going forward. Um, so one of the first things is always be aware of your emotional response. If you find yourself having an emotional response to something, you need to try to pause and question why you're having an emotional response or what are you responding to? Um, because the stronger the response, the more likely it is that you're being manipulated. Um, one example I'd like to, to sort of call out is with curiosity. Um, a lot of identity theft scams tap into curiosity. Um, I, for example, a few months ago, I got a bunch of text messages, random text messages saying that somebody had tried to deliver a package and they couldn't reach me. And if I just click here, I can arrange for re-delivery, right? It's a, it was a, it's a, it was a phishing scam, right? But I would be curious about, oh, what package? Who's trying to send me something? 
So always be aware of our emotions. Try to check your emotions. Try to have, try to be a little reflective about how you're processing information, right? Are you being rational or are you perhaps engaging in emotional reasoning? Now, the challenge is, is that if we're, if we're down a path of emotional reasoning, we may not realize it. But this is where we have to be asking questions, right? When we reflect on it, are we questioning what we are seeing? Or are we just accepting it at face value? Are we accepting it because it feels true and or because we like how it feels and it supports our belief? So we need to be reflective, make sure we're engaging in rational reasoning, not emotional. Um, Google it. You know, we have a resource called uh, Eight Tips to Google Like a Pro. We've shared, we share this a lot. Um, we'll have a link to it in the chat here in a second, probably. But this is where that skepticism is. And verify information for yourself, right? With a simple Google search, you can verify something in a very short period of time. With a lot of things that we see and with like election misinformation, there are there are so many fact checkers out there working diligently to, to try to debunk falsehoods. Chances are, if you Google it, you'll find a fact check about it and you'll be able to do that. And part of that is to sort of look at some of these fact check organizations, right? Um, bookmark some of these. Bookmark the ones that you feel most comfortable with. Right, um, I I in, endorse all of these. Right, I think they they're all doing great work. They're all they're all very transparent and diligent in their methodologies. Um, I think you can you can trust the fact checks that you that you see from these. But don't just take my word for it. You know, go check them out. Look at how they're doing the work and determine for yourself if it reaches your threshold of trust. Right, because you have to be able to trust the information for yourself. You don't have to take my word for it. Um, but I but I would encourage you to look at some of these and think about which one you might use as a go-to for checking things out. Um, we obviously we we're doing this in partnership with the League of Women Voters, but if we're talking about voting information, find a nonpartisan group that's out there trying to inform you um, in a way that is nonpartisan about election-related information. So vote 411 from the League of Women Voters is an excellent resource. But also ballot ready is another great resource because you can actually you put your address in there and they can actually just give you information related to everything that's going to be on the ballot for you on November 8th. Um, there's a number of them out there, um, but look for the ones that are nonpartisan. Look for the ones that are trying to be informative and not trying to persuade you or be manipulative. Um, I would also suggest you take a look at our website at newslit.org slash election 2022. Um, this is where the recordings for these webinars are going to live. So if you go there now, you can actually get the link to last week's session where you can watch that. When we process the video for tonight's session, that's also going to be posted there. And then you can also, if you haven't, you can register for next week's session on November 1st, we're going to be doing a conversation about debunking misinformation. What are the best practices for trying to push back? And how can we talk to people whose beliefs are based on misinformation in a way that is productive and, and hopefully non-confrontational? So that's going to be a great session. That happens. That's going to happen on November 1st at five o'clock Eastern time. If you haven't registered, you can go read, you can register there now. And like all these, it's totally free. And then you, we would love if you would check out Rumor Guard and join the Rumor Guard. This is a relatively new platform for us where we're not only fact checking things, we are talking about how the process works and how you can practice some of these skills for yourself. You don't always have to rely on other people's fact checks. You can learn the, you can learn the tools, you can learn the steps, and you can see how and why certain things go viral, whether or not something is, in this case, so there's an example here about a, a, a story that was just, that was very misleading, right? Um, and there's, and it talks about five different factors. If you go to rumorguard.org slash join, um, you can sign up and you can get alerts when we, po when, we when we post a rumor guard. We can talk about the tools that you can learn how to use. Um, and you can be part of this effort um, to push back against misinformation, to promote good habits and uh, uh, in news literacy, and how to, to act on verified, credible information. So um, I'm going to, we're going to come to the end here. Um, we would love your feedback. Um, there's a QR code here, and then there's a link. 
Um, I'm going to take a look at the uh, some of the Q and A while we do this. So Amy asked, "What is clickbait farming?" Um, so generally, you know, clickbait is you know it's a it's a link to a post somewhere, an article, a web page, and it's it's designed to have like a shocking, engaging sort of hook. Um, and clickbait farming is often where it's a combination of publishing the same thing across multiple sites, um, posting it across lots of different social media platforms, and just basically the idea of getting the link in front of as many eyes as possible to get people to click on it. And every click generates just a little bit of ad revenue. Um, so Kelly Vickstrom Hoyt says, I find it so hard to find any nonpartisan sites with any candidate information. Most nonpartisan sites only have how-to info. Any idea, advice on where to get find candidate information? Well, I think one important stopping point is either your local county or state board of elections. Um, I think you can, when I know here in Chicago, I can go to the Chicago board of elections. I can put in my address. They'll tell me not only where, where to vote, but they're going to give me information about what's on the ballot. Um, and some places will give me more detailed information about the candidates. One thing I miss about being in California, I grew up in California. Um, I miss the voter guides that California publishes. You get all kinds of detailed information. But look to your local county or state board of elections. That could be a good starting point. But there are some sites out there that also do, um, they do put some information about candidates. Uh, let's see. Um, okay, um, that's in the Q&A. Um, all right, let's go to the chat and see. Voters, so Trudy posts in, in the chat, votersedge.org for California. That's a great, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I do wish Chicago had those voting guides too. That's, I, I missed that. It was, that was, I remember, you know, I, growing up, my parents would always get it, and, and I thought it was the weirdest thing. But then, when I when I registered to vote for the first time, and I got ready to vote in my first presidential election, um, when I got that, when I got that, it was it was really cool. Um, so Mary Jo mentions about recorded phone calls. So robocalls are being sent out to Michigan voters with disinformation, um, and but so it's not just Michigan. There have been a number of cases around the country where these robocalls are spreading outright disinformation. How are they allowed to do that? Um, the same way that we constantly get phone calls trying to talk to us about our car's extended warranty, right? There are all kinds of people who are who are trying to, you know, with these these robocalls are trying to exploit us, to manipulate us, and um, they're difficult to stop because some of them are are run by computer programs, and we can't always track it back to where it comes from because they spoof numbers. I know, I know the FTC and a number of people are working to try to identify the sources, but it's it's very, very difficult. So I'm going to stay on here for just another minute. Um, if anybody has um, any other comments or questions that they would like to share, um, I can stay on. Um, we have just about another minute. Um, thank you very much for joining us this evening. We really appreciate you taking the time to join us and to learn from us. Um, on behalf of uh, everyone here at the News Literacy Project, we are very thankful for your support. Um, we're, we're glad that you're here and we're, we're hoping that you will continue working with us and learning from us and practicing what we're trying, to, what we're all trying to do because, um, you know, having a credible election and being informed and engaged voters is incredibly important. So thank you very much for your time tonight. The recording will be made available in the next day or two, so make sure you go to our website. Um, and so um, thank you, and, and please enjoy the rest of your evening.